And so I want to welcome you. I'm Tim Jacobs. I'm the uh, district superintendent for EFCA West, and I've had the chance to uh, hopefully meet most of you. Um, and uh, it's great to be with you. Glad you're with us today. We're going to hopefully be here for uh, an hour and no, no longer. Um, but the topic today, and if some of you have been with us for many weeks, some of you maybe this is your first time joining us, is reopening weekend services and open forum discussion. And so with the 55 or so we have registered, and we'll see how many we get to, it's going to be pretty hard to have an open forum. Um, so I recognize that. But rather than, uh, as I was hearing some feedback, rather than just having one particular guest the entire time with us, we wanted to maybe open it up more and have more opportunities to share and compare notes. So we're going to just kind of walk through that as best as we can. Um, this, this is being recorded, so you can go back and watch this later. It will be uploaded to our YouTube uh, link, uh, or to our YouTube page, I should say. And uh, as well as, uh, please use the chat box, by the way, too. Some of you guys have been producing some fantastic resources uh, regarding reopening documents and, and things like that. If you, if you have links to that that you'd like to share, um, you know, please put that in the chat box or if you have any other questions. And we'll, we'll do our best to try to, to, try to uh, keep this as uh, non-chaotic as possible as we have a, a lot of people here on this call. Um, Alex Rivero, are you on? Are you on yet, Alex? I don't know if I see you yet. I know he was on the previous call. So since I don't hear him, um, I am going to, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick on, uh, on Jack Hamilton. Jack, are you there? I see, you gotta unmute there. Would you, would you open our time up in prayer today, Jack? Sure. Father, we just uh, thank you for who you are and that you even called us to be called uh, children of God. And we just treasure in the fact that we're part of your family and we appreciate that. We just pray, Lord, too, that you would give us a heart for those in the world that are less fortunate than us, just to give us a heart of compassion and tenderness and care for those that you've put in our flock and the ones that we give oversight to. So help us to do that. And I pray for Tim. Thank you, Father, for his leadership and his heart for other pastors and leaders. So we pray that this meeting would be helpful and fruitful and encouraging and just really challenging to all of us to be what you would want us to be and the churches that you've given us to lead that uh, we would represent you well. We just pray these things in Jesus name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys for being here. What I want to do is start off by, um, I, by uh, asking actually Ray Chang. Ray's a good friend of mine. We've been friends for gosh, you know, 15 years or so. Um, and Ray has done a tremendous job for many years in his church plant. He's got two campuses, one in Anaheim, one in Brea. So both campuses in Orange County. And, um, and really, what I want to ask, ask Ray just to kind of start us off and maybe ask him a couple questions. And then as he kind of, we kind of springboard from there, uh, other people definitely jump in. But uh, Ray, so I want to ask you, um, you've got a couple of campuses, you guys have, are in different, you know, it's kind of a different context, but we talk about reopening Sunday services and I want to make sure we, we cl clarify terms because a lot of people, and, it's, and we have Bob Osborne on the call and he's going to be talking a little later. And I love about Bob is Bob's a stickler for language. And so he's always wanting us to be precise. So when we say reopening church, we, the church hasn't closed down. In fact, for, for many of you, the church has been more open than ever in terms of your reach and everything else. So let's, let's rejoice in that. We're going to specifically talk about reopening Sunday or weekend services because that's where I think a lot of the issues are getting really sticky for us. Mm -hmm. so, so, Ray, um, uh, what are you guys, can you just give us an overview? What are you planning to do as of now when it comes to reopening uh, weekend services? Yes. Well, Tim, it's great to be with all of you uh, pastors. Um, I know we are in a very um, challenging uh, season, and, and I know uh, every state has different requirements as well, and different counties uh, have different requirements. So uh, one of the things that we have been uh, working through is a document that I actually put online here. You can download it, and it's our guidelines for church opening. And what I wanted to do was to be able to walk you through a, a few of the key things that we've been thinking about uh, as a church, because I feel like um, 
you know, sometimes we as, Christ, we as pastors can be very reactive to what's going on in our culture and, and good and bad. And so this document is really more of a proactive way for us to think about uh, how we can be proactive about really helping us think. So the first thing that I think is important is, uh, and we didn't put this on there. If there was one thing I would want to change in my document is maybe more of a theological biblical basis for opening up. Uh, you know, I've been listening to a lot of webinars from two groups of people. On, on one hand, you have uh, Larry Osborne did a great video uh, last week on why churches shouldn't open up. And he talked about the importance of, of, of quality, the importance of, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, uh, we're, uh, you know, our children's ministry. He had, he had three or four good points. On the other hand, we have uh, a pastor in Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, named Jack Kyle. Uh, I'll send a link to his video where he feels like we have to open up. And he set uh, May 31st as, uh, and that's Pentecost Sunday, as the day to open up. So he's calling all the churches to open up on May 31st. So, so on one hand, you have, you know, people like Osborne and the other, you have, you know, people like Jack Hibbs. Um, and so I think every church has to kind of walk through that. Um, so uh, one of the things that from a theological perspective, you know, uh, we believe it's essential at some point for, for the ch church to gather physically and part of that has to do with the whole idea of what the body of christ is uh, we as the body are a gathered community and, and and of course you know we we talk about using video and all that but but that's that's a poor substitute for, for the actual f physical gathering together and we're not just talking about a good sermon or music we're talking about literally uh the the, the way in which we are to pray for one another we, we are to lay hands on one another, anoint each other with oil all those there's there's biblical gathering a uh, process that's i think is essential now at the same time you have to balance that out with uh the the seriousness of of this virus and how rapidly this virus can spread so so where's the balance between that well those are the thoughts that i think all of us are going to discuss tim's going to talk uh, ask all of you because i think all of us are going to be on some spectrum well in our draft we wanted to look at you know just the theological biblical importance you know, do not for the, forsake the gathering together of believers. And we see that in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Um, and, and that's still our priority is we want to still gather. And, and, and let the church be a place in which people ca can come. It doesn't mean that we have to just gather on Sundays, but for people can come in for prayer. Uh, people can come in for, uh, you know, counseling, uh, for food. And so our churches actually can be utilized more than just the Sunday gathering as well. So, so we have two uh, main things that I, I just want to walk you through and real quick ray can i jump in a couple yeah. people said they can't they can't access the document you've got to like have a permission or something oh really i'm sorry um yeah. let me make sure that uh, uh okay let's see get shareable link um ray's the technology expert in my in, that i that i know of one of the best guys on technology <laughs> so i'm sure you'll i'm sure you'll figure it out if anyone yeah, can I'll right? figure it out uh let me see here. So I didn't want to uh, throw you off track there. there but. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, anyone, uh, uh, anyone more? Just, uh, it's public now. Okay, so. Great. All right. So it's public. It, it was uh, only set for my church. So. <laughs> there you go. So, so you, had two, you had two things you were going to run through us quickly. Yeah, yeah. So, so we want to look at, you know, what's the, uh, the government uh, policy, you know, I mean, so we have the White House guidelines, and then we have the state of California guidelines. So I put that in my document. California has um, basically four stages that they're looking at. Uh, stage one is, uh, you know, kind of where we were, which is stay at home. Stage two is non-essential manufacturing, schools, childcare. Stage three is hair salons. Church is not, not until stage four, which means that uh, there could be a long wait. Uh, some people are saying, uh, like uh, yesterday, the county of, Orange, uh, county of LA uh, said that they may have a stay home until August, uh, you know, July or August, which to me is, is that's, that's, that's a long time <laughs> to be at home. And so for the churches to be at stage four, which means, you know, where's the balance between uh, us you know, as a gathered community, the essential, essential part of that uh, with, you know, this whole idea of, you know, I mean, stage four is concert venues, convention centers, sporting events. Um, there are, uh, there's a, um, a Pacific uh, Justice um, uh, 
it, it's a, a group that advocates for churches. There's a whole bunch of churches that are now uh, suing the state of California um, uh, that they believe they should be part of stage two, which they equate with schools uh, more so than with concert venues. And so that's happening right now at the Pacific uh, Justice Institute. And I got a, a notice on that yesterday. So we've been really keeping uh, abreast on all the news that are happening. Uh, recently, we just found out yesterday that the whole state of California, the Cal State schools, are all going to be closed this fall. And there are some serious ramifications to that, not only from an academic perspective, but from an economic perspective. And so, you know, those are the things that we have to sort of take into consideration. There's the health issues, there are the political issues, uh, there are the, the economic issues. Uh, but for us, you know, as, as pastors, we have to really think about what are the theological ramifications of the church not gathering. Um, so yeah. those are things that I think all of us will, we could talk about. So once, uh, so for the month of May, we have decided uh, as a church that let's begin to get our staff back into motion before we get our church into motion. In other words, getting our staff uh, back into the office, uh, using the church more in terms of as uh, HQ, because a lot of our staff were just staying home working, which was good. Uh, we were doing a lot of video uh, from home, but we felt like the staff needed to come. So we have two campuses, uh, one in Brea, one in Anaheim. Uh, we have about 15 uh, slash 20 with our interns and residents. And so we do have a little bit of a larger staff versus for uh, some of you who may have you know, different sized churches. But we felt like staff engagement was number one. So that, that's our first step. Uh, stage two for us is now figuring out how do we slowly open up our churches um, for some gatherings, whether that be small group gatherings and using the church as more of our uh, recording venue as well as, you know, some of those things. Uh, and then stage three is where we actually have public service. So stage one staff, stage two is we're, uh, we've been broadcasting our services on Sunday. We have a live host. Uh, we pre-record the message on Thursdays. We have different people playing music. Uh, only the live host is live on Sunday. I know some of you are, are still broadcasting Sunday live. Uh, so for us, stage two is let's have a live service starting in, sometime in June. And so we will then broadcast on Sunday morning uh, our service, whether there's people or not. So that's going to be our stage two. And then stage three is going to be uh, opening the church uh, for gathering. And, and again, uh, if you look at my uh, uh, list, there are a lot of ways that we're going to be preparing. Uh, deep cleaning the church, uh, paying attention to children's ministry. We have some of our children's ministry people here online with us. Uh, telling the congregation through flyers, doors, emails, how we're going to prepare the church. Uh, there's going to be, uh, we'll prop open all the doors, have one-way traffic flow, temporary signage, um, you know, send email to the church. So there's going to be a lot of communication uh, that we're going to uh, deal with or, or in terms of uh, service time. Uh, we're probably going to keep our services one service rather than multiple services. And uh, because we have two campuses, one of our campus meets remotely in a public venue. We may bring that service to our uh, main campus in Anaheim, which is a, a church facility. So we're thinking through all that. Um, I think part of the challenge for us is we want to be in concert, uh, not to be disobedient, uh, and to be good citizens, but at the same time, not to neglect our calling as pastors and, and shepherds uh, and to balance that with the health issues. So those are the things that, that we have thought through. Uh, again, this is a work in process. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be scheduling a webinar for our whole church, anybody that wants to jump in, and we want to get our church engaged in this, in this you know. Part of the thing that I think the church needs to do is to communicate this. But there are other issues that we need to really seriously consider that when we don't gather in community, uh, there's the uh, mental health ramifications. Right. Uh, you know, the, there's, there's people that are seriously isolated uh, that need community. And, and yeah. so, again, uh, you know, video is a great technology and, and, and I think all of us have maximized <laughs> what we can maximize. But there is something that's missing about the presence of one another. So yeah, anyway, that's just yeah. You know what? That's song. great. That's great, Ray. You you said too that you I, I like that idea of doing a Zoom call for the whole church to talk through and prepare them. That's a fantastic idea to yeah. to offer a Zoom call just like we're doing here 
and say, hey, let me, let's just walk because we can send out the document, you know, on Home Trust, they read it, but then walk through and even, even get a chance for Q&A um, to, to let them express their concerns and, and fears. Um, that, that's a great idea. The other thing I'd just like you to briefly talk about, then we're going to open it up and then uh, have, uh, talk to some other, um, to have other people jump in as well. When you and I talked on the phone yesterday, you had said you were concerned about a second wave. And just briefly address that because there is the possibility, and I think everyone's got to know this, I think there's this rush to, to reopen and let's do all this stuff, but then what happens in, in October if all of a sudden it gets yanked back and you can't meet again? Exactly. So one of the things that we have to think through, again, I, I'm, I'm you know, a uh, forward-thinking person all the time. I'm, I, we're always constantly saying, what are the things that may happen? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, and this is where the government – you know, and we've been getting so many conflicting stories. Uh, we don't exactly know um, what's going to happen, but we are predicting or we are preparing, I should say preparing, for a second wave. And if that does happen, how do we uh, readjust? And I think the first wave caught us by surprise. I think many of us, we had to shut our doors very quickly. And um, originally it was only supposed to be for two weeks, then it extended to a month, and now it's two months. Uh, and again, uh, they may extend that even further. Um, you know, there are some practical things that we have to consider. One is to protect those who are vulnerable. And, and that's our biblical mandate is to protect the weak. So we are going to still encourage people. And one of the things that we're trying to do is not to make a mandate where everybody has to come to church. Uh, th there are people that are still living in fear and anxiety for whatever reason. And, and, and we're going to phase this in. Uh, but we may have to revert back. And now at least we're better prepared for that, for the second wave if that happens. Uh, and so to even have that discussion with uh, your elders or your leaders or your staff and your church. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, that doesn't happen. Uh, but in reality, I mean, we see that the state of California, unless there's a vaccine or unless there's some other treatment, the reality is that, that it's going to be sort of this roller coaster ride that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, about the next year. Okay. Well, that's great. That's, I, I like that. I'd like the forward thinking on that too, because it's not just forward thinking. Isn't just how do we reopen? It's also how do we reopen with the idea that we may need to prepare our people that we may have to revert back. And that's going to be mentally very difficult mm -hmm. for a lot of people to even have to, you know, it's like, Oh my gosh, now we have to go back. It's almost like that PTSD thing. Like really we have to live through that again. Absolutely. Um, there, there are some, uh, incidentally, and I don't know, uh, on, I live in Arizona, um, but we have staff in California. There's some talk about, is it stage three or stage four? Maybe we can get some clarity on, on that in terms of when churches can open. But I think the point is that, um, you know, we need to be aware of, of this and figure out, you know, what stage church, churches reopening on Sundays belongs in. Um, Mark Brown has a question. Is anyone aware of, of state in terms of California, specifically regulations for smaller gatherings in the church building, any allowance for gatherings other than Sunday morning services? Anybody want to chime in on that? Uh, originally, we had heard that it was about 10 people, you know, and, and I think that that's where, uh, um, you know, a lot of churches were still functioning on Sunday morning service, you know, with, with 10 people. Okay. Uh, in California, every county is going to be different. Yeah. And that, that's going to be the, the problem there is that the state is deferring to local health officials. And so uh, we really have to check on that. I, I would just uh, throw out just this idea of it, when, when we hear things from the government, we need to understand that our government does not understand our ecclesiology absolutely when they say that churches need to close all they see is a big building with you know 500 people sitting hip to hip uh, as i used to say behind the belly button in these pews that are really close together and spreading disease amongst ourselves they have no clue that the church is the people not the building in which they gather and so I think we need to be uh, we need to be wise and courageous and flexible about about the fact that no the church isn't closed the church is scattered all over our community and we can talk to each other uh, we just can't all come to the same building and talk to each other uh, I went for a walk I, I had a 15 minute talk this morning with one of my neighbors we actually talked about spiritual things which is unusual for that conversation and we did so while we stood in a you know quiet residential street 15 feet apart 
Yeah. You know, so, I mean, we're not closed. We can still counsel people, talk to people, pray together. There's all kinds of things we can do. We just are not allowed to occupy that building because government doesn't understand ecclesiology. And I, and I think that needs to be the continuing narrative for a lot of us as well, because not only does the government not understand ecclesiology, I think a lot of our congregation members maybe not understand it either, because I know a lot of you are getting pressure. Uh, I had a guy call me this week from my, the church that I just, that I just uh, stepped out of um, in Goodyear, Arizona. He called me this week, and he knows I'm in a new role, and he said, I, I'm concerned. Um, uh, why, aren't we, why isn't the church reopening? And um, so anyway, that, that, that's, a, that's an important question. Um, Dave Welch, you, you raised your hand. I appreciate your politeness, your Zoom etiquette there. What did you have to say? Dave Welch. Yeah, and, once. yes. Hi. How are you guys doing? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, really, at this point, uh, Mr. Osborne really answered that uh, very appropriately. One thing that I do appreciate uh, for the state of California is we're so different. Uh, if you go to north versus central versus south, very, very, very different. Um, and he did, uh, Governor Newsom did release it to the, the, the local county authorities. I just had a meeting uh, this last Saturday with uh, members of our church. I got the mayor, the city administrator, and our uh, chief of police. and our district, uh, school district nurse, uh, got them together. And realistically, what they told me, or at least told the, told the group of people that were, were planning our reopening phase. And so we took the same idea as you did, Mr. Chang, and did a phasing that was representative of the state of California and kind of drafted that. I like yours a lot better than mine. So if you hear about some guy in the middle of California stealing something like yours, it may have been me. Um, there's, uh, but our, our city officials uh, basically told us we're not going to uh, enforce anything. They, our chief of police said uh, constitutional right to gather still exists. We're not, gonna, we're not going to enforce anything. The mayor would rather us open than do anything that the, um, I guess government has to say, and our city administrator just really wanted to say that um, it's it's up to us. So it was very hands off, very hands off. So I, I would recommend that you contact your city officials, or at least your county representative, to find out what the what the right answer is. Because going to the state is not going to get you the at least in California, <clears throat> it's not going to get you the answer you're looking for. It's all it's all county. Great, Jack Hamilton. Saw your hand go up, sir. You're muted. Uh, it would seem to me that, you know, that each church is going to have to do what they believe God would want them to do because of the, you know, a bunch of these churches in Southern California, maybe even broader than that, that are, you know, planning to gather on the day of Pentecost on May 31st. It would seem to be a good idea to me to have some kind of a position paper or a statement by each church as to what you are doing and why. Because I think there will be a little bit of, I don't want to say backlash, but people in your church will wonder why you are not meeting on the 31st, if that's what the Lord, you know, uh, says to the elders and leaders at your church. It would seem to me to be a wise, and I know a couple of churches that are already doing that, going to have a statement uh, as to what position they hold just to kind of be proactive and preventative with a bunch of their people getting upset because they're not meeting, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, you know, sometimes it's less about even the decision you make and more about how you communicate it and why you're making the decision you're making so that the people in your church can understand the thinking and the process. Because, you know, it's like anything else. People, you know, and that's what this, this conversation with this guy who called me and I tried to explain to him. I said, you know, there's a lot of thinking that's going into these decisions that are being made as to, and he was really upset about why the church had not reopened and saw it as a religious liberty issue. Right. I don't know if any of you guys are dealing with that right now, but there's a growing number of people who are seeing this as a religious liberty issue rather than a a pragmatic and safety conscious and you know wise 
thing. Um, and if anybody wants to, actually, Robert Campbell, you raised your hand. I'm going to give prefer or deference to those who raise their hands and use the Zoom etiquette. So, Robert, uh, do you have something to say about that, or was there some other comment you had? Uh, just along the, the same lines here, our, um, our local officials have been very responsive and in interacting with the, with the churches and the faith, broader faith community. Um, our DA has said to us um, that, how do you say it? We, he will not be prosecuting any of these pieces. Um, however, according to the state, we are not allowed to gather. Okay, 50s, 10s, you're not allowed to gather. Our DA said, go ahead and gather in 10s at the same time our emergency health officer said, but we can't say that because the state won't allow it. So that, that was the last conversation to a group of 50 faith leaders in ours. So we're left with a little bit of that quandary of what can we actually do? There was some give with one hand and take with the other. They said, in essence, they would give us permission, but they couldn't give us permission from the state. See, now, I think that raises uh, probably one of the, the stickiest issues. And Bob Osborne, you know, I'd love for you to chime in on, on this um, and anybody else that wants to chime in, because this was what Dave Welch brought up. And I, I really think this may be one of the key questions that, that you guys are going to have to wrestle with is what do I do when my local, my local, especially if you're in a smaller place and you have, you know, you're, there's a relationship there. And I know Kern County, this is the way it is in Kern County too. They're like, we don't, you know, from what I understand from the talking to some of the Kern County pastors, they're going, our sheriff's department is not interested at all in enforcing uh, Governor Newsom's rules, um, you know, that sort of thing. What do you do when your local officials say it's okay, but you know that technically you're violating the state? So, uh, you know, Bob, you're a, you're, you're a, a former sheriff. Um, I'd just love to throw that hand grenade to you. And then anybody else who wants to chime in? Well, uh, I use a silly example of it. And that is that um, in, in my town, it's illegal to put my garbage cans out on the street before 10 p.m. the night before collection. And I have to remove them from the street within, I think it's two hours after the can has been emptied. I can guarantee you that my police department does not enforce that, and yet it is, in fact, the law. And so that, I think, is the issue that we as church leaders need to face, is that we're, we're finding ourselves being drug into a political conversation instead of a biblical conversation and that relates to what is, in fact, the law. And I, and I think what happens is the law tells us what we can and what we cannot do. Uh, scripture tells us what we should and should not do. And I think that's the difference that we as church leaders uh, need to take into account. The, issue, the question isn't, can I do it or can I get away with doing it? Because my local official has told me usually on the slide that, hey, buddy, we're not going to enforce this law. It's still illegal. It's still unlawful. And so I think we have to deal with our, our understanding of what it means as a Christian to obey uh, the commands of Scripture. Um, you know, how, how do the commands of scripture that tell us to obey, uh, you know, the local authorities, the governing authorities, why is it, you know, where stands it written that it doesn't apply in this circumstance? I think that's the question we have to ask. And just, just by posing it that way, that's, you know, you kind of know the end where I fall down on. Uh, and, and that is that I, I think we, we have a, a obligation as Christians to obey all of scripture. Uh, which includes that we're going to follow the law. And it doesn't mean, again, that the church can't gather. The church is not the building. The, the, our buildings could all go away and we're still the church. Uh, and we can still talk to each other. We can, we can be on the phone. We can be in a park together. We can stand on the street corner together. Um, you know, we can stand in line out of, outside of Trader Joe's Market together. Uh, six feet apart, wear a mask, and we can still talk about the Lord. We can still share our faith. We can encourage one another. You know, we, we can do all those things. So I, I just think we, we need to be careful that we don't get swept into uh, the politics of the, uh, of, of the conversation. Um, you know, what does Scripture say has to be, in my mind, we're church leaders. It has to be where we start. We have to deal with Scripture first. And sometimes we have to teach people in our congregation things they don't want to hear. And, um, you know, we just, we need to be strong and courageous. Uh, I, I, I was sharing with the other group, uh, 
my favorite devotional you could have with your elders is in Joshua chapter one, where three times God told Joshua to be strong and courageous. The first time to be strong in, in recognizing and resting on his promises. The third time was to, you know, was to trust God and, and you know, get going. But the time in between, God said, be strong and very courageous. And that related to obeying God. And so I think we, we as leaders, we have to look at, you know, how are we going to explain scripture, um, you know, to, uh, to our people? And, and even Robert, like, like, you know, your question there about uh, gathering, what is a gathering? Are we not gathered unless, unless you know, two thirds of us are in one building at the same time? Does that mean we didn't gather? Uh, is, is the church only gathering if, you know, if we're all in the same building? I, you know, I mean, those are things that we have to decide uh, and that we have to share with our, with our congregations. Clarity is our friend and words matter. You yeah, know, so. and, and, you know, and I think as we have been wrestling through all the various issues on these Wednesday webinars, and thank you to those of you who have been with us, you know, over the weeks, and we've been trying to craft certain kind of narratives that have come through. And, and you know, and even going back to when we had Chris Brown with us talking about Hey, rather than trying to reinvent yourself in the midst of a crisis and trying to and running your staff into the ground, trying to keep up with every last thing, you know, the concept of a forced sabbatical, the concept of understanding that we're all in this together and that, you know, everybody's got to figure out how to get toilet paper and how to homeschool their kids and all this kind of stuff. So let's, let's have some grace and mercy on, on ourselves and, and, and each other. And these kind of themes that have been emerging, I think another one that is unique to EFCA West, even though we are spread out so geographically, is this concept of let's, let's make sure we're not walking in lockstep with everybody else and let's be wise and let's not, let's not make rational or irrational decisions about this. And, you know, something interesting that I'll point out when this, again, this gentleman that called me, and I think it was of the Lord that he called me, he's out of the blue. Uh, somehow he had my, my cell number and he called me and he, and, and he was kind of upset that we hadn't been, the church hadn't reopened. And I made this point to him. I said, you know, pre-COVID, because I kind of knew his church attendance patterns. And I said, you know, pre-COVID, uh, um, we, we as pastors never, uh, we, we, it was always pulling teeth to try to get most of our congregation to show up more than twice a month, right? And, and now everybody is upset because, you know, the church should be open and everything else. So I just said, listen, when the church finally does reopen on Sunday mornings, I would hope that everybody that's been so upset that it hasn't been open will be there every single Sunday, regardless of kids sports, regardless of Super Bowl, regardless of anything else, because it was, it's so important to you now when honestly, you know, before all this, it didn't really seem like that big of a deal whether we were open on Sunday or not. To a lot of you guys. So I mean, I was trying to be very nice about that, but it's, it is interesting um, how we need to, you know, we need to temper some of the emotions and also realize, I think that, that our people, as they're going through this, they're grieving too, like they're, they're coping and they're going to cope in weird ways. And so they're going to kind of, why isn't this happening? And why isn't that happening? Because they're mourning some of the things that they've lost. So just, just a thought on some of that as well, to keep some of those ideas in perspective. Dave Arnold, you had something you wanted to say. Well, and just from an Arizona perspective, I, our, my, the city that my church is in is on the border of Arizona, California, and Nevada. So we have a confluence of all of those states happening, but it is very different. Our governor was like, well, I never really said the churches couldn't meet. It's just been so vague. And so by this Sunday, our church will probably be the only church that isn't gathering corporately. Like every church in our community has taken the religious liberty. This is a conspiracy from the government. We're going to stand up. You don't need to wear face masks. Come on in, have faith. And so we're already feeling like, hey, why are you not opening? What's your problem? So as we've talked with our leadership team from March, we really, for us personally, it was two questions. Really, what does love, what does love require us to do, specifically loving our neighbors ourselves? Specifically, what is our witness to the non-believing community about how we're going to engage? And what's the right thing to do based on what is the right data that we can trust? I mean, there's so much. What facts do we know? So we made a decision uh, that probably would line up more with kind of um, Chris Brown, Larry Osborne. We're, we're choosing not to open corporately until the end of June at the earliest. We've already made that decision. 
We've already broadcast that decision. We've made videos, we've explained the reasons why, um, because we needed to give clarity to our volunteers. Because you know, you're talking about VBS, you're talking about, I mean, they just canceled challenge for the students. So there's so many ministries that we wanted to give clarity for all our volunteers. In the same time, we put our small groups, which we call community groups, they're all online. Our Sunday gatherings online. We have just moved our children's ministry. Everything is online. So Robert, I resonate with the tension of what is the gathered and we want to gather. But once you can't put the toothpaste back into the tooth, the tube, if you open too early and then you're the source of an infection spreading throughout the, we just looked at all those factors. And so in Arizona, it, there's a different problem that I think we're struggling with, which is that we're just getting so many different facts and kind of the, well, we never really told you not to meet, but boy, if you screw this up, we're going to, you will be the focus of wrath. So. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's great input, Dave. I, I appreciate that. And again, I think it's that, it's that theme that we're trying to say, hey, can we let cooler heads prevail in some of this stuff? And I know like, you know, hey, it's, it's great to have the, the and I, I, know, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, but the theatrics of, you know, of a Gibbs that, that gets on there and says, we're going to open up, you know, no matter what. And, and then you get some of the news coverage and you get some of that notoriety and you, you get that, you become the de facto, you know, resistor, resistor of all that stuff. Well, you know what, that's it, that you can do that. Um, but I think um, what, we're, what we've been trying to say is you really got to think these things through. Um, we're going to, uh, Dave Welch, you have, we have one more comment you wanted to make, and then I'm just going to throw some things over to, to Bob. And then again, if you guys want to, please raise your hand, comment. This is, this is great what's happening here. So Dave Welch, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, kind of ask this, you know, just to kind of everybody is, I don't know how you guys are handling this as pastors, but receiving information, like you were talking about, uh, uh, Mr. Osborne, Bob, you were talking about how we're getting drug into the political fight here, and it's not really what we're about. So how do you, how do you really try to um, bring balance to the fact that, at least in my area, by the way, I'm, I'm from Rocky Hill Community Church in Exeter, California. It's right in the middle, and it's really, cons um, I would, it's like little Texas here. And um, what I seem to be getting daily, if not multiple times a day, is forwards from, quote unquote, insider information of some sort of conspiracy theorism, you know, from all different aspects into my messaging group. I'm getting text messages. Like things are becoming difficult to handle uh, because from my perspective, for my church, I believe that I'm called to be the shepherd and the shepherd carried the club along with the staff and the club was there to protect from danger. Okay. And so if w I want to do everything that we can to create a safe, secure and strategic plan to reopening our church, how do you help project that to the community where they don't feel as if we're being uh pacifistic or we're, we're, mm. you know, not joining the, not joining the, the, uh, uh, the, the rebel, the resist, the rebellion of the March or the May thirty first. You know, how do you kind of teach the people like, no, we're doing this out of love. How do you, how do you approach something like that? Yeah, I, I, if someone wants to jump in on that. Um, I, yeah, Patrick, I see your your hand raised there. Uh, can you unmute? I'm an elder at the uh, Bridge Bible Fellowship in Reseda. Paul Brown is my pastor. And we had an elder meeting last night. And uh, the elders collectively determined that we were going to um, uh, be shut down as a as the church till our next elder meeting, which was June 9th. And we... we uh, are going to let our, our community know, but it's submitting to the leadership. It's submitting to the decisions that we make. Our county is down till May, I mean, uh, August. So we, uh, we're we in a different situation than a lot of other people uh, that are here. But in LA, uh, uh, we, uh, we just have to be prudent and we have to have our uh, fellowship submit to the leadership of the uh, church. And that's kind of where we're at. I, I, you know, there's, I know you have all kinds of, difference of differences of opinion, uh, but we are, uh, we are, our elder board 
collectively, we have 14 elders, we collectively determined that we will not be uh, doing, making any decision until June. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think, again, the theme there is communication, you know, is, is you made the decision and you're communicating, this is what we're doing and this is why. And I think that's much more important than maybe even the decision itself if it's not communicated clearly and with a, you know, a sense of conviction, but also with a sense of, of open-handedness. Hey guys, this may change. We, this whole situation is fluid and most people aren't used to that kind of fluidity. I mean, this whole thing is, we, we, we thought we knew what we were, you know, people were planning vacations a year ago and they were planning, you know, and, and everything's off the table now. So, so the, the church meeting is, is in that as well. Uh, Tim, Etherington, you had uh, something you wanted to say. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thanks. I'll try to make it real quick. Um, we have to keep all of this in perspective. We do have uh, Romans 13 and 14 telling us that we should obey those above us, that those uh, authorities are given by God and that we have to obey them. At the same time, there are times when we must disobey those authorities. For example, um, think of communist uh, Russia during the, the Soviet era or uh, in China where they're telling churches, you cannot meet, you may not meet. In that case, you would have to um, respectfully disobey. What we have to keep in perspective here is that's not what's happening here in America right now. We're being asked not to meet, not because they determine religion is illegal, but because of public safety things. And so this is one of those things where we shouldn't be first and foremost Americans uh, but we should be first and foremost kingdom members in Christ's kingdom and say, what would Jesus have us do in this? What is the, the a proper approach as a member of the, the kingdom of Christ? Well, we have to love each other. We have to care for each other. And so we're going to take the government not as this overwaning authority that says thou shalt not, but take them as a source of wisdom and insight and information and say, this is what they're telling us. Let's make these kind of decisions. So you don't rush to buck the government, nor do you rush to obey the government. We have to look at it as, as uh, members of Christ's kingdom and say, what, what's the, the Christian response here? And so yeah. I just think it's important to keep that two kingdom perspective uh, in mind. No, I, I love that. And, you know, I think the other thing too, uh, I, I think that there are people, and it goes back to kind of this concept of people really are struggling. And, and there are a lot of people that are very concerned about religious liberty. Um, and, and I think we need to make sure that we are communicating that we are as well. You know, it's, it's not like we're saying, hey, we don't, come on, don't go overboard on this. Don't, you know, uh, we don't need to engage in conspiracy theories. But I think, there's a, I think there's a way to say, hey, those, there's a lot of us that are very concerned about religious liberty. And that's, we should be concerned. And if, if it ever gets to that point where they're singling out churches and saying, no, you can't meet, that's when it's going to be a different issue for us. And, and you, know, you know what I mean? I think, I think to acknowledge the concern that is a right, a right and good concern that people have without letting that dictate, well, because of this fear, we have to go and, and uh, you know, make this decision or that decision. Uh, Robert Campbell, you had uh, your hand raised. And just simple and quick, I mean, with these questions, because we have a relationship with our, our county officials, we call regularly and email regularly and say, help us to know how to answer these questions to our people. Mm. Help us to show them that you on our behalf are addressing our First Amendment concerns and we are fully behind your advocacy and thank you. Right, so we then are able to have direct information, both our, our most recent local health concerns and what our officials are telling us to do. And we can also go back and say, and they are advocating for us in the areas where the state is showing concern. Yeah. It's been a, a very good way for us to be able to continue to submit to our leaders and to ask our questions and concern to our leaders. And they're giving us answers. Well, mostly, right? There are areas where maybe we'd like our questions answered. But yeah. it's, been a, it's been fruitful in that place because we can continue to go back to the con congregation over and over again. One more piece is that we had also just as elders determined that we are not going to reevaluate things every week and told mm -hmm. the congregation that too. Unless something big comes, we're just going to, We'll look at it again, maybe every two weeks, maybe every month. But as it is, we keep status quo for a bit, right? Yeah, and that, so you're yeah. kind of slowing things down a little bit and not, you know, it's not the tyranny of the urgent. Um, though I, I think there's some wisdom in that, definitely. Um, I wanted to, to ask, um, I wanted to, to ask uh, Eldon, 
Eldon, you're, you're in Utah and you guys have apparently already opened up. Can you give us any thoughts as to, you know, uh, you're, a, you're ahead of it in a little bit in terms of some of the rules and everything else. What's happened out in Utah? What are churches doing? What are you seeing? Yeah, we, uh, um, both the state, the state, the governor issued a directive that allowed uh, church gatherings to start. Some churches started last weekend. Um, many of our area churches are starting this, and some are still waiting a little bit longer. Real quick, um, Eldon, is your, is your video on? I, I had it on, and okay. it, it isn't working, so I apologize. Okay. We'll just have to, that's fine. Pretend. Yeah. Um, I'll look here. Um, so, so what that means for us is, is one of the pastors here that talked to the Lieutenant Governor's office that handles the COVID uh, responses uh, said, it depends on the size of your building. So if you had a 10,000 square foot building, you could have easily an artificial number. Like at Walmart, uh, Walmart employees would, could allow 970 two people in um, at a time, and they had, I forget how many thousand square foot buildings. So the same kind of principles uh, were handed down towards churches. So uh, in our church, then we can reorganize, we have a small church, we can reorganize the seating um, in family group areas with uh, kind of a six foot um, spread between them. And so it's, it comes down to about a third. And the local restaurants are opened up. Um, they're required at a 25% capacity. And so, um, and I think as somebody earlier mentioned, one of the, the things is if, if they allowed the sports teams or concerts to happen, but not churches, then I think it would be a different issue. And so talking to our health department and the governor's office, it seems that if we follow the mandates that they've given us, which again, are probably reasonable. Um, and so we're gonna open for the first time this Sunday. We'll have greeters with masks and gloves. We're, um, we haven't figured out if the, we'll have any coffee that with people with masks and gloves, you know, serving people rather than self-service. You know, those kinds of, of accommodations and to spread people out in our building where there are speakers if we can't easily do that. And uh, so that's how we are adjusting to it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, um, how it feels, right? Of what I, you yeah. know, I remember as a church planter, you know, I was made the joke that, you know, we were having, we would have social distance services whether we wanted to or not. And it didn't feel very good, you know. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see, though, will, will the anticipation and the desire of just the, you know, to get back together, if that will fill in some of the, that dynamic that happens when you don't have a lot of people in the room. So, I, that, no, that's, that's good to hear. Um, Bob Childress, you had, you had a, uh, something you wanted to say. Hey, so I'm uh, Bob Childress from Church of the Canyons in Santa Clarita. Uh, just one thing here in Santa Clarita is, is we have uh, – some really good solid evangelical churches here and uh with the help of of many of our pastors we've kind of banded together and and put together a collective statement uh that we're sending on to our state representatives to our governor and it will also be published in our local newspaper here and the whole idea is that uh we're we're under orders because of scripture and so we will follow that uh, mandate uh, but we, uh, I think there's strength in numbers in terms of as we deal with congregations who, who there are always a few who go rogue and who want us to uh, make a, a statement, a political statement. Uh, and so when all the churches, and right now it looks like there are 13 that have signed onto this document, we'll probably have 15 or 18 by the time it's done. Uh, basically, everyone here then in Santa Clarita in the evangelical circles that we are in uh, will have um, made a statement. Also, I think it's important that we balance this very essential element of we must obey God rather than men when it comes to the when it, when it comes to those things that are against us. I don't think that's what's happening right now, but I do think that we we have the freedom to express our opinions, and we ought to do that before our city councils, for instance. Uh, we had a city council meeting last evening, and uh, many of our pastors and elders uh, wrote emails to our 
Santa Clarita City Council just stating uh, where we were and where we fail and that we believe we should be seen as essential. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're going to obey our authorities, but uh, living in a representative government, we are allowed to speak. And I think that's good for a congregation when they know that we're making our opinions known, that we're meeting with other pastors and going by certain standards that we are all following together. And uh, I just think there is value to our congregations in them realizing that that is taking place. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good word. I lo- I, that's a very good word. Um, I want to uh, give Bob Osborne a few minutes. If you have not had a chance to read what we sent out last week, um, that was 10 things you ought to think about before reopening, you, you really, I think that has gotten more um, traction and traffic, that one article, than pretty much anything else we've sent out. And, it, and uh, you know, uh, no, there's nobody better on this subject, I think, than Bob, um, just with his, uh, his years of wisdom and, and his, the way that he thinks. And so we're so privileged to have him with us on staff. And so, Bob, I want to give you a couple minutes to just to, to, to chime in on that if you wanted to talk about that or adapt any of the parts of that to, to this discussion. But if, please, if you, we sent this out on Monday with a little um, video that I made, and it's, it's, there's a link to that. If you haven't had a chance to see that, you got to take a look at that. So many pastors have reported that's just been a, a really good guiding document for them in terms of principles to think about as they look at this issue. So, so Bob, um, what, what, I just want to give you a chance to give some feedback about that. Thanks, Tim. I- I, I think the most important comment in that document was point number one, don't reopen because you can, reopen because you should. That, that's actually the proper um, decision-making framework for, for us. I, I would encourage you to read it, but I, I'd like to address things really to kind of what we've been talking about here, just some, some thoughts of, you know, uh, someone sitting in listening to the conversations. Um, I think it's, again, it's really important for us here. We're kind of like family. We're working through stuff, uh, planning on the, on, on the fly. But when we talk to our congregations, we have to know what we're saying. And I'll pick, cause I love Tim Etherington and you know that you use three buzzwords that your civil libertarian, uh, far right extreme congregants are going to sh- blow you up over when you talked about, when you use the word public safety things, we've been restricted because of public safety things that they're going to throw right back in our face. Um, you know, well, that's what we're afraid of. They'll just deem anything a public safety. So the reason we're not meeting is because the COVID-19 virus has not gone away. It is still deadly. It still kills people, infects people, makes people deathly ill. It's still highly contagious and we don't know how to control it. That's why we're not meeting. Um, that's why the gov- whether we agree or disagree with the government's measures and frankly, you know, I disagree with a ton of them. I see no reason why Vons can sell flowers, but my local florist cannot. You know, I, it makes no sense to me. Um, but anyway, it is, it is the rule. And then, you know, and so I tend to be a, a rule follower. But we need to be careful with the words we use so we say what we're trying to say. The words we use desperately matter and we need to be clear. Uh, we're, we're not, we're not going to tell people we, we, we can't meet at church because we'll fairly shortly be able to meet on our church facilities in small groups with social uh, physical distancing. We'll be able to do that. We just won't be able to have, uh, again, large church gatherings, you know, however many you would consider large, you know, my, my church facility, 350 people packed in pews sitting hip to hip. We're not going to be able to do that for some time. Well, why can't we do that? Because the COVID-19 virus has not gone away. It's still highly contagious, deadly, makes people deathly ill. That's why we're not, we love you and our community too much, um, you know, to, to, to go ahead and do that. Um, the other thing with, with, the, with the zealots on any issue, but in this case on either side of the spectrum, We just as leaders have to be convicted in our own heart, fully convinced of what we believe needs to happen. I absolutely believe in and support the autonomy of the local church. I don't expect that we'll all be in lockstep spread throughout seven Western states. Every community, every church is different. And I respect the decisions that local church church leaders make. Uh, But we have to be really clear about what it is we're we're doing and why we're doing it and what the important things are. 
Uh, and so, and then we need to be courageous because the zealots on any issue, when they confront us with that, we will not be able to change their mind. Their mind is already made up and they're not coming to us for information. They're coming to us to pressure us to make the decision that they want to make, but they do not have the responsibility to care for, to lead, to oversee the flock of God that uh, those of us who have that ministry of church leadership do. And so, you know, I don't want to kick them out of the church. I smile and be nice to them, you know, but stay firm with the decision you made, assuming you made a good decision in the face of that zealous, uh, zealous uh, opposition that you may encounter. That's the true test of our leadership, is that we can lead with strength in difficult times. Uh, it's easy to be a pastor when everybody sings all the hymns and they tell you every Sunday, they shake your hand and tell you what a great sermon it is. It's hard to be a pastor when we try to protect some in our flock from themselves. And so again, that's the question. If, if you're in, you know, we don't serve Modoc County in California, but if you were in Modoc County, I'd say everybody's in church on Sunday. They haven't had a COVID-19 illness throughout this whole stinking thing. Um, Orange County will probably open. I'm in Los Angeles County. Um, you know, we're, we're probably not going to be having large group gatherings on, in our church campus facilities for quite some time, but we'll be meeting in homes as soon as, as soon as the health people say 10 people can gather again. We're going to have church in homes and it, we'll preach online and people will sing and the church will be the church. So, you know, let's be flexible. Let's support one another in the decisions we make and let's talk about them. To me, the most important thing that your, your denominational staff and other church leaders can do is to listen to your ideas and talk with you about them without the same pressures you have to actually, you know, make any particular decision. We get to kind of, you know, um, we, we used to call it what, red teaming. You know, we, we, we can be kind of the bad guy and say, are you sure you want to do that? Have you thought about this? Like I, I always get a kick out of some of the plans that I've seen for churches. They say, we're, gonna, we're, we're not gonna pass out the bulletin, we're gonna set them on a table so that people can pick them up. And it's like, well, let's think about that. Is it really more healthy to have everyone who walks in the door touch the same stack of papers or to have one guy with a mask and gloves pass it out? You know, and, and sometimes it just takes somebody who's not usually meeting with you all the time to ask that kind of a question. So let's, you know, let's support one another. Let's talk to one another. Let's ask questions instead of making statements. And I think we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll find ourselves coming out really well on the other end. So I encourage yeah. you to read the thing. You can get it at efcawest.org. It's kind of a shortcut to our, our page on the EFCA national uh, website. And up at the top, there's, I think it's a red ribbon that uh, says something COVID-19 or something, and it's got everything that we've written on COVID-19 listed there. So again, if there's any yeah. way we can help you, any of our team, please let us know. We, we'd love to come alongside you and help you work through the decisions you make. Uh, absolutely. And you know, that's why if, if, hopefully you're on our email. Well, obviously you're on our email list if you got the, uh, the please, if you want to you know, forward it on to other people. And, and again, I think one of the main things that, that emerges through all this is this is a time that requires courageous leadership. We don't know what to expect, but we know that God's going to be faithful every step of the way. Um, you know, we were in a, a, one of the pastor gatherings for Inland Empire, or no, it wasn't Inland Empire, it was Orange County yesterday. And the, the, uh, one of the things that was brought up was the, the, the verse from Esther that, you know, you, you, are in, you are in the position you're in because you've been called for such a time as this. And if you feel un, unqualified, if you feel incapable, welcome to the club of the 68 people or whatever that showed up on this call today. We, are, we all feel that way. Um, and so, there, by the way, we, we're going to make this about the, just the chat box alone has been fantastic. We're going to get back to, um, uh, I, I know someone requested uh, Bob Childress's uh, statement that he was talking about that, that we'll, he has sent that to us. So we'll make that available to you as well in a follow-up email. But um, I'm going to ask Alex Rivera, who's our director of all people ministries, if you would close our time in prayer. I want to be faithful to your time to keep it to one hour. So Alex, would you close our time in prayer and pray, pray over each one of these pastors and leaders? Sure, my pleasure. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, the moments that we can have here for this 60 minutes. And Lord, what we want is wisdom. We, you know, you ask us to, to ask you. 
and uh, uh, humbly we are asking uh, that you gave us wisdom from your Holy Spirit. Uh, help us to understand, uh, read and discern the times that we are. Don't let the culture, don't let the world rule in, in your church. Uh, we, we want more than, than ever, uh, be sure that we want to do it according to your will. So protect our mind, protect our hearts, and, and actually control our emotions. We, we can be very emotional at these times. So help us to, to be uh, guided by your Holy Spirit and what your word says. So thank you for the opportunity to serve you. And thank you for all these pastors and leaders that we have here this morning. Uh, and we, we want to be a light and continue to be a light and a salt seasoning for this world. So uh, we are the bear, we bear, we bring hope uh, in your name. So Lord, thank you for, for this time together in Jesus Christ. Amen.